Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, it's Tommy and Dwayne. This is for the Sunday morning Bible class. And uh, I just appreciate again so much all, the, all of you following us and, and uh, encouraging us in all the ways that you can. Um, let me start off by saying that we need to be thinking about one another in the body of Christ here. Uh, there's a lot of folks probably hurting very, very much. And we need to show that love and show our care and our concern for every last one of them. We need to be praying for this country. And we need to be the people that God wants and expects of us to be. And as I, I think about this, I was thinking about how all through Peter's letter, how he's been trying to stress the idea that for us to be the people that we need to be, it boils down to being like Jesus. And that's a, such a big struggle, you know, because this world is a sinful world. The events that we're seeing and hearing right now are actually because of sin, because of what happened in the garden. And the only solution to this is found in Jesus Christ. So as we look through this and continue to meditate upon this, we need to key in on the idea that for us to make a difference in this world, we have to be like Jesus. Chapter one at verse, first Peter chapter one at verse 21 and 22, who said, who through him believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. And he says, since you've purified your souls and obeying the truth of the spirit and the sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. The idea is, is for us to love one another fervently, we've got to love one another as Jesus and as God loves the world. We go on in the second chapter, verse 23 through 25. And it's interesting, and I think this is why the people that divided this in the chapter, maybe this is the reason why, it seems like they close every chapter with this idea of looking back to Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 23. For this cause you, because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example, you should follow his steps. Is Christ and God hurting over what's going on in the world right now? You know they are. And you know them realize that it's because of sin. And you know that he is the only solution. And so he says, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. As we go on in the third chapter, verse 18 through 22, Christ suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were this when most of the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah. And he says, That eight souls were saved through water. And we think about the going on in the world today, and I mentioned in our bulletin article, you know, we're all descendants of Noah too. Think about that in that respect. And so the reality is, as you're looking at this, he suffered once for the just, for the unjust. He will go on in the fourth chapter, verse 13 through 19, and I'm not going to read it all, but he says, Rejoice that you are partake of Christ's suffering, for when his glory is revealed, you shall be glad with exceeding joy. And he will say, If you reproach for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory of God rests upon you. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, or an evildoer, as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. And then he will end the book up by saying, But may the God of all grace, chapter 5, verse 10, who called us to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. But the bottom line is, is all of this is God is for us, and God is going to be with us. He tells us how to live and he tells us what we need to be doing. And so as we begin tonight, we're going to begin with chapter three. And we're going to talk about probably just as verses one through seven, where he emphasizes the relationship of a man and a woman in a marriage, how important it is that as he even began to talk about the idea of submission to government, submission to master. Now we think about the importance of our relationship to one another in our marriages. Marriages, like everything else, are being attacked by Satan today. And we see it from the homosexual agenda. We see it from the lesbian agenda. We see it from the idea that there is no such thing as marriage, that we just need to do away with all the marriage laws. We go away with what God has said. And let's also be honest in the church, we have marriage problems. 
How many folks in the church have been divorced? How many folks in the church have had problems? And so, again, God is speaking to us. And again, it's a lesson that we listen, need to listen to, but more importantly, we need to live. And so with that in mind, Dwayne, we start off with you. And just... Sure. So Peter continues this thought, right? And in and, and this chapter, he continues giving instructions to the classes or groups of people, right? And you kind of touched on this already. Right. And so he starts off chapter three talking about wives in, in, in first Peter chapter three, verses one through six, he's given some instruction for wives. And then, then he starts with the husbands in verses three, verse seven. And then he talks about the community of Christians as a whole, and then maybe even some, some looming persecution is about to come. He speaks of the blessedness of suffering of righteousness all the way through to just about the end of the chapter, uh, verse 22. So when we get in this idea of first Peter chapter three, verses one through six, Peter starts out wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands that even if some do not obey the word, they without word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe their, your chaste conduct accompanied by fear and do not let your adornment be merely outward arranging the hair wearing gold or putting on fine apparel. Rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Because Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Now, when we look at First uh, Peter chapter 3 and look at the first couple of verses, we can draw a very similar context from Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as a Lord. And Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit to your own husbands as fitting in the Lord. Now, there's one thing to note here, um, that submission of the Christian wife um, to a non-believing husband, and that's what Peter's really trying to draw here, and that there, a woman can have so much influence over her husband is a point I wanted to bring out. And Peter's saying, as a, as a believing wife, you walk in a certain way so that your husband may become a believer. Even if he's not a believer, you walk in a certain way as a Christian would. Now, when we go back, and you touched on this a little while ago, when you go back to the stories of, of Adam and Eve in the garden, Adam was very clear on his instructions because he was able to recite them to Eve. Now, we think about Adam walking in the garden and having a direct relationship with God. He walked with God in the garden. And I, it causes me to think of Thomas saying that, you know, until I see, feel, then I'll believe. Well, Adam was there with God. He had him in his presence. And Eve was still able to influence him to partake of the fruit. Now, let's, take, let's talk about that for a second. And if we could just imagine if, if we had marriages where our wives would always influence the best of us. Mm -hmm and how we would conduct ourselves and how we would walk with ourselves. And not to say a wife is responsible, but if she has that kind of influence over her husband, how much better could I be as a husband if my wife was trying to influence me to do the right thing? And so it's very, you know, it stands out to me that Peter's using this as, as a, a way of teaching to say, as a wife, conduct yourselves in such a manner that you set a great example for a non Tommy. And, and you know, you, you've got to remember the context of what he's talking about here and as well. In that world of that day, wives were treated as slaves in a lot of situations. Aristotle would say that among the barbarians and the barbarians to the Greeks were everybody that wasn't a Greek. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but they, he would say in essence that the woman and the slave hold the same rank. Okay. And so you think about the, laws regarding that from Genesis chapter one, how God emphasized that the woman was to be um, serving or submissive to the man. We talked about the idea of submission being that you put yourself up under that. Right. In this situation, it, it seems like in the context that he's talking to, to women who mm -hmm. become Christians 
and their mm-hmm. houses could not. Now tell me we don't have the same issues today. And again, they, you know, so should then the, these Christian women break their relationship with their husbands? Paul will talk about this a lot in First Corinthians chapter 7, where he will emphasize the idea, no, 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 you are to stay married. Mm-hmm. And who knows whether you might, he would say in First Corinthians 7, who knows whether the believer might sanctify the unbeliever and sanctify the child there in that situation. So Paul would emphasize that same idea here. So think about how hard it would be for a woman that's trying to do what God wants her to do and have a husband that is standing in her way every step of the way. Mm -hmm. So often as well. And so Paul nor Peter says, okay, you need to get a divorce so you can live the Christian life. He said, both of them. Here in 1 Peter 3 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says, you stay in that relationship. You put yourself under his authority and you try to help him to understand what God wants him to do. I also want to share with you some other ideas. (laughs) Think about our culture today and what women's live, for lack of a better term, how do women feel about this today? Is the struggle to do this? Do we really have any role models on television or anywhere else showing us the kind of lives that we should be living? Is this not the case that the church should be setting that example by godly women submissing or being submissive to their husbands? Does this being submissive, and again, it goes back to the idea that we don't understand what that is, we put ourselves up under somebody, we are there to help them, but does this limit the influence the wife can and should have on her husband? I know this from the fact my wife influences me more than ever she could ever possibly imagine. Do we have a relationship in our homes? And again, this is the reason why we're not going far in this passage today. We have a relationship where our homes were husband and wife are friends and feel like that they can discuss anything and guys do we husbands pay attention to our wives are they trying to tell us something that uh, we need to hear but we're just dismissing them how does this ideal of submission as he's bringing it out here and don't get me wrong, Paul is, or Peter is going to address the husbands, as Paul does in Ephesians chapter 5, mm-hmm. talk about the husbands and their responsibilities in this matter. So the bottom line is, in all of this, is that we need to understand that we have a responsibility in our homes and in the church. Think about it this way. Those of you that are older, you may sit back and say, well, I'm not all that important in the church. Yeah, you are. Because you may be setting an example for a young Christian lady about how she needs to live her life, what she needs to do, and how she needs to be submissive to her husband. So I submit unto you, let's just really sit down and think about this in a lot of detail and meditate upon what he's trying to emphasize to us. Okay? Comments, Dwayne? So uh, you brought up some great points and, and we're going to touch on that, that whole idea. You know, I started out saying, you know, Peter brings out, you know, three principal ideas. He's bringing out something for the wives to the husbands and then to the community. Um, I too echo the same intimate sentiments that you have about my wife having the influence uh, in my decisions. And, and a lot of times I do seek her counsel in things because she's going to give me a perspective that I didn't account for. And so I, I do go to her for her counsel and I do ask her thoughts on certain things. Now, if you were to ask her, she'd probably say something different, <laughs> but uh, I, I do hear her more than she probably thinks I do. Um, I think there's always this running joke in married couples that, you know, husbands don't really listen or hear their wives. And, you know, they have on blinders for their eyes and they also have on blinders for their ears. But I would charge you that husbands are probably listening more than what they're given credit for. Now, as we transition into the next verse, verse three, um, 
when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. And so when we, I think about, or that's verse two, um, I think sometimes people misconstrue this verse and they think about chaste conduct, it means silenced and uh, quiet and, you know, with no voice. And, and that's not what, what Peter's bringing out here. Um, if, if someone can observe your chaste conduct, I think Peter is talking about the fact that you have respect uh, and you recognize the order which God has called. And, and this is not just for women, this is for men also, right? And you have respect for one another, you have respect for God, and you have a fear for what he desires for you to have. That's a good conduct that you can have about yourself. And, and too often, I think this this uh, this verse, and especially the next verse, a lot of times is taken out of context. And in verse three, do not let your adornment be merely outward arranging the hair, or wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be hidden, uh, uh, the hidden person of the heart. I've had, as you continue to read this verse, I've had Christians that are black, uh, black women, ask me. Am I wrong for wearing braids based on this verse? And, and it's a good talking point to kind of share and talk about this because uh, some verses or some translations will reference braids. Some verses just says arranging the hair and it causes some people to stumble in the Lord's church. And my, my thought on this and what I've studied and found out is that you can't allow those out things to be so uh, your whole makeup because God is more concerned about your heart and so wearing these things aren't um, a sin but if that is the makeup of who you are and that is the brightest thing shining about you then there's a problem Amen. because it's the interior person the inner man as Peter would talk about and Paul would talk about that God's really concerned with. now do we have a responsibility not to be overbearing I think we do have a responsibility for not being overbearing is there something to be said about wearing modest clothes and something that's not too uh, revealing? I think there's something to be said about that. Do we have a double standard in the world when it comes to some of this stuff? Yes, we do have a double standard when it comes to some of this stuff. Um, but I think at the end of the day, I think the overarching message that we need to remember is that God is more concerned about the inner man than the outward apparel. James would bring up the idea we shouldn't treat people any differently because they look better, they dress cleaner. We want to, you know, cater to that look or apparel. And then the person who doesn't look the same way, we, we may stand off from them or we may not be as willing to share the gospel with them. And so I think that's another lesson that we can draw out and, and, and what Peter's talking about, about the apparel and the outward look, right? Is that outward look. And Christ would call the Pharisees about, being whitewashed, right? But be dead on the inside. You look real nice on the outside and dead on the inside. So I'm thankful that those outward things are the things that are going to, you know, make us better people. It's not going to get us in that, you know, heaven, but it's the inward man is where the heart sits. Right. And I think, you know, let's think about it in that respect. You're, you're exactly right. In another sense too, our hearts are shown by what we wear. Our hearts are shown by what we do. Our yes. hearts are shown by what we say. Our hearts are shown by what we don't say. You, you start getting into a lot of this stuff in this respect. And so the thing that Peter's stressing, the thing that God has always stressed, is it's not the outward adornment. It's not the clothes that you wear. It is your heart. And the only person that can change people's hearts, obviously, is God, God and his word. And so that's so vitally important. So I think as Peter's talking about this, he's trying to emphasize the idea. You want to change your husband? You change yourself first. Bottom line is we can't change anybody but ourselves. We can only change ourselves. And so the thing that we've got to think about is that if I'm going to make an impact on somebody else's life, I have to start working first with me. I can't tell somebody to go out there and stop drinking if I'm drinking there all the time. I can't tell go out there and tell somebody to get off drugs if I'm on drugs. I can't do that. And yet so many times the Christians are being charged with being hypocritical. Yes. That's exactly what we do. 
And so what Peter is stressing here in, in the ideal of these women, he says, let that incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is, and notice this, very precious, very precious in the sight of God. Some versions, the King James says, is, is in the sight of God of great price, okay? Um, Paul and Peter both would be talking about those of, of wearing gold and everything like that. And they may be ostentatious on the outside. The bottom line is, what are you on the inside? And wives and, and men, all of us need to really be honest and look at this. Because I've seen some guys dress some ways that I'm like, okay. And again, it's, it's telling us their heart. It's telling us their heart. So he emphasizes this idea. And as always, as Peter does, as I mentioned in the very first part of the lesson this evening, is he's always trying to give us examples. And the greatest example is Jesus. But he's going to go on now and talk about the example of some other women. And the greatest one he's going to use. Notice he said, the holy women. Notice the word holy. He's used this word all the way through this book. This is an important word. These are the ones that have been set apart. The holy women who trusted in God adorned themselves. How? With that inward, with the inside. And they adorned themselves by being submissive, putting themselves up under, the authority of their husbands as God had said. Join. So I, I think you bring out such great, great points here about this, this manner of, of women, you know, holy women, right? And when we think about a holy woman, mm -hmm. holy being right with God and good standings with God, acceptable, accepted by God. But then he brought up this idea of who hoped in God. And, be, and with their hope in God, they adorn themselves being in subjection to their own husbands. And so when we hope in God, that is the banner of Christians. Uh, I had a conversation with you earlier that some are holding on to hope. And that hope is the last thing that they have to survive through the, the challenges that we go through. Right? And, and there's this subtle indication here that the position of a Christian woman to Peter wrote here, to, you know, is that... Um, not only did she have a hope in God, but she depended on others too. She may have depended on her husband. And, and he talks about this in, in, in the first next few verses, that's how Sarah saw Abraham mm -hmm. as Lord, right? And I think that is another verse that's taken out of context because man sometimes in their futile thinking is, as Romans chapter one would say, in their futile thinking, and as, as, as you know, New Testament would, would bring it out too, that men would lord over women. And that's not what should be the case, right? It was a respectful um, moniker that Sarah was giving to Abraham. Um, and it wasn't a, an a, a, a idea where Sarah controlled Abraham either, because we have instances in the Bible where Sarah gave her her handmaid to Abraham and say, hey, take her, and this is what you're going to do. So it wasn't that Abraham was, you know, just lording over her and controlling her. Um, but then there are times where she was able to show her respect to his position as the head of their family as well. So I think that's another idea that we, we need to kind of bring out and talk about here as we talk about holy women and recognizing the relationship between her and her husband. But it goes both ways. And Peter doesn't let the husbands off the hook because we're about to. <laughs> And a, and, a, and a verse or two, Peter's about to drop a bomb on the husbands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you, you, again, to have a good marriage, you've got to have both mates that, that, that are Christians, that are striving to serve the Lord, mm -hmm. have a respect for one another. And again, he, he, again, you mentioned the idea of Sarah obeying Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. The idea of, of being so afraid of people mm -hmm. and being mm -hmm. afraid of them. I mean, you know, sadly, some men rule their homes out of fear. They, they, they are rule with an iron fist. And there's not a lot of love. It's just, you do this. You, this is your command. This is what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Sadly, or in the other respect, some men don't lead as they should. 
And what winds up happening is the women have to take some of those leadership positions because they're not doing, the husbands are not doing what they should be doing. And as a result, that's going to create problems as well. So the thing is, is we, we go from one extreme to the other, it seems like in our lives. We go from one stream to another in a lot of different things, and we do it in our families as well. Mm -hmm. We discipline a child, and, and we try to teach that child what he needs to do. And then sometimes we come down too hard. Sometimes we don't come down hard enough. Mm -hmm. And so you struggle. You struggle trying to figure out what's the, what's the medium. Where's the, and the thing is, is again, you have a relationship with one another where you trust one another, where you love one another, where you have the respect for one another. And you know that both of you are trying to do what's best for the family as a whole. That's the kind of relationship that God wants us to have. That's the kind of relationship that I believe was in the Garden of Eden and that you will see in a lot of people's lives today. And so that's what we need to be doing. So you want to get us only into the husband's part or you want <laughs> so, so I want to bring out a thought before we go there. So I, the oldest, the oldest union we have in the Bible from man, you know, from a man perspective is the union of husband and wife, but it's also supposed to set the example for us as Christians, as we talk about Christians being there for Christians. Mm -hmm. You know, we're supposed to go the extra mile, so mile for our brothers and sisters, and we're supposed to go the extra mile for those who are hurt. And yes, God has given, has given special instructions to husbands and wives through the scriptures. But I think a lot of those same principles we can apply to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah. How about laying down your life for a brother in Christ? As, as, as uh, Paul instructed the, the husbands, you know, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, all the way to the point of giving his life for the church, right? And so I think we can, ex we can express and show the same thing for brothers and sisters because it's the perfect design of God as it relates to a union, and we are unified through the blood of Christ. Right. And so therefore, I need to know my brother's going to lay down their life for me, going to be there for me, and walk with me as I struggle. And, he, and God used that perfect design that can be carried over into every relationship we have in life, not just, as you mentioned, a parent dealing with a child and a, you know, and a parent dealing with their parent, because the Bible talks about that as well, about looking out for your parents right. and, and taking care of them. And so I think it's the perfect design, and, we, can, and we, should take, we should take all of that and be able to apply it to some degree to all of our relationships. So Peter then transitions into verse seven. And when I think about Ephesians and what Paul says, husbands love your wife, as Christ loved the church, um, I think I, I kind of go back to this verse and understanding how do husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church. Here's one of the ways and not the exclusive way. And one of the ways is husbands, excuse me, in like manner, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, giving honor to the woman as unto the weaker vessel. Um, being joint heirs or heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. There's a lot there. Uh, there's a whole lot there. And there's an obligation, you know, that every, that, that Paul and Peter brings out that wives have to their husbands, but there's also an obligation uh, that husbands should have to their wives. It's a reciprocal nature that the Bible brings out. And so no one person is the, the you know, the one side leader. It's a reciprocal deal should go both ways. It's the same relationship that slaves should have with their masters. It's not one sided, it's reciprocal. And it's the same with parents and children. You know, fathers bring up your children, do not provoke them. Kids obey your children in the Lord. It's a reciprocal relationship, right? And everyone has a responsibility. I think in our society, you kind of touched on this earlier, our society has let some off the hook. I will go as far as to say some of our practices and principles and policies have allowed some to be off the hook. And that's not what God called us to be. That's not what he designed in the marriage, that no one was off the hook. Everyone had to be involved. Everyone had a responsibility. This idea of dwelling well with your wives, 
Um, I, I read one commentary that says, this is very similar to husbands cohabitate with your wives according to knowledge, which is the light of the probable meaning, right? And we could probably dice and slice this up several ways, but dwelling well with your wives according to knowledge. I always thought this was an interesting verse, um, especially it says understanding them with understanding in one translation. And we know that uh, there's a running joke that women think with one side of the brain and men think with the other. So I don't know how I'm going to understand how I'm going to understand what she's thinking and what she's talking about. Right. But it's a perfect compliment. That's right. It is a perfect design and a perfect compliment by God because we were created in his image and he knew exactly what I needed from my wife to help compliment me and vice versa. So understanding that now allows me to not look down or look beyond her, but I look to her and I give her honor. And I give honor to the wife, as the Bible says, and as the weaker vessel and understanding that we take this verb, we take this verse out of context a lot too. Understanding that she's the weaker vessel, I can tell you that my wife is stronger than me in many areas of life than I can ever dream of much stronger than, than I am. And I'm thankful that she has the strength that she has to help enlighten me in certain areas. Now, as the weaker vessel here in the context, and we can go into detail about this, you know, some think this to be from a physical perspective, some think this to be from a spiritual perspective, but we have very clear Bible examples. When we look at Timothy's life and where Paul spoke of Timothy, he had a great influence and helped to shape him to be the preacher he was and the Christian he was from his mother and his grandmother, mm -hmm. right? And so we, we can never discredit where, where women's roles are, where our wives' roles are in our lives. And as I mentioned earlier, how much influence they have on us as men and how they can help us to be better men. So I'll, I'll give you a, I'll break Tommy and let you give some thoughts here. Well, going back to what you're saying, I agree with everything you said in that respect. He, he emphasizes the idea of giving this respect, giving honor to the wife. And again, it's something we can give her. You know, we, we think about whenever we're dating our wives and all, we give them gifts and everything. And then mm -hmm. another, whenever you're both living together and you got to pay the bill, if you ain't got money to give like you once did. Well, here's something we can do is honor them, give honor to them because of what they are. Mm -hmm. The word honor, interestingly enough, in this passage, it emphasizes the idea of precious. He says, giving honor to them because they are precious. This is the same mm -hmm. Greek word in chapter one at verse 19 with the precious yes. blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. So the very same word here translated precious. So again, we need to regard our wives, our faithful wives as precious to us and give them the honor that is their due. And like you said earlier, when it comes down to the, the weaker vessel, uh, like you said, I agree with you 100%. My wife's the same way. She is stronger in so many ways than I am in so many different ways. And I, I'm just grateful for the compliment that she's there. So uh, the question always pops up, exactly what way is the wife weaker? You know, um, and so I started listening. Okay, what are some ways? Intellectually, well, a lot of women are smarter than some of the men in certain areas, okay? I don't know that I could expect my wife to sit down and, and figure out some uh, cabinetry or something like that. But I do know this, and when it comes to finances, she is so much better than I am than I, than I, than I am. I'm great for that. Morally, a lot of times women are, except again, we're living in a culture today that's getting it farther and farther away. Moral women are by and large morally, because they are striving to live like God and trying to be what God wants them to be. You know, they've been taught that spiritually. There is that disposition that women are more inclined to be religious and follow God. And I've got a book in my office. I haven't yet read through it. I've read it for a couple of chapters of it, but the idea is, is why men don't go to church. And the reason, according to this author, is because we have allowed the church to be feminized. That is all about the women. It's all about what the women should do. And, and, and so why do we now have situations where we have women preachers and women elders and women this and women that and women serving in all of these positions that God saved for men 
And it's because men haven't stepped up to the plate and did what God wanted them to do. And brothers, I just challenge each and every one of us to be honest about this situation in, in the fact that we need to be leading prayers at home. We need to be leading prayers at churches and it ought not to be the same guys all the time. I'm trying mm -hmm. to something here. Okay. We have feminized the church. That's why men don't want to go to church. As a result, the church has lost something. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we are doing our job as we talk about this whole idea of our responsibilities, the women's responsibility to the husband, being submissive, um, calling him Lord, having a relationship to where she knows that he's always going to do what's best for the family, mm -hmm. having a relationship with our wives to where we are the leaders of the family. Mm -hmm. Sometimes let's also be honest. Sometimes we just kind of sit back and let the ladies lead because we take the lead that we need to. Um, and sometimes brothers, uh, it's something that should cause us to stop, think, and really be honest about what we're doing and how we're handling it. Men need to respect their wives and honor them. And not just on mother's day, not just on the anniversary, every day of our lives, we need to honor them and thank God for them. And guys, we need to be the husbands we need to be. Okay. And going into the next thought of being joint heirs, I totally agree with everything you said, Tommy. And this next thought, next thought of being joint heirs of the grace of life, um, my, my wife helps to complete me in a lot of things. And I'm thankful that we are one, as the Bible would call a man and a woman to be in Genesis. The two became one flesh, and, and she is a joint heir. I, you know, I go back to what I said and what you said earlier. She's probably going to have the greatest influence on me making it to heaven. In multiple ways, she's going to have that influence. Um, and she, she's going to encourage me. She's going to keep me accountable <laughs> when I'm stepping out of line or I, or I may say something that's not the right thing to say or the best thing to say. She's going to call me on it, right? And she's my joint heir. And and I'm so thankful that she walks with me, not behind me and not in front of me. But she walks with me and we can walk together as joint heirs to the grace. And I, I help to encourage her and she helps to encourage me. Um, and then Peter brings out this, some may say a radical idea in this illustration here that if we're not doing this the way we shouldn't perhaps, that our prayers may be hindered, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he's giving a, almost an if then statement like husbands, okay, here's what you need to do. And if you don't do it, there's possibility that your prayers may be hindered. Yeah. And you should be trying to strive to be the best husband that you can be, to treat your wife as uh, with, give her honor, understanding who she is to you and how she can help you along, being a joint heir with her. And then you mentioned this earlier, not just praying with her, but praying for her as well. A prayer of thanksgiving. You know, the Bible says a man who finds a, a wife finds a good thing. Now, sometimes we don't always feel that way. We're humans, right? And sometimes we don't always agree. Um, and I had a Bible study a couple of months ago, and the Bible says a man who finds a wife finds a good thing. And I said, I love my thing. <laughs> I love my thing, and I don't say that in a in a bad way at all. Um, I I love my wife dearly, and I know I have a good thing by you know by her being with me and helping me to in this walk in life. So, and I agree with you. One of the things I kind of looking over my notes a little bit and going back this idea of vessel, mm -hmm. vessel, it suggests the idea that we're both vessels. Men are vessels too. She's just a vessel. And a vessel is something that is used, an instrument that is used. Mm -hmm. And in this situation, men and women both are used by God in his service. So again, it's an important thing to think about. And that's the reason why going back to what you're saying, Dwayne, you're exactly right. Whenever we're not treating our wives the way we need to, when wives are not respecting their husbands and being submissive, you're going to have discord. You're going to have problems have difficulties. 
And, you know, one person said this, one of the commentators said this, where strife and discord obtain in a home, prayer is cut into and interrupted and the message to heaven is short circuited. Mm -hmm. And so bitterness, division, bickering are all opposed to the spirit of prayer and operate to terminate all of our prayers. Mm -hmm. And I like what that guy said in that respect, only when peace and harmony prevail, can the husband and wife join their efforts in united prayer to the throne of grace. Mm -hmm. And so think about how important that is. Not going to bed angry, struggling to go through and work through the problems and the difficulties mm -hmm. and making sure that whenever you're praying together, your prayers, when you pray together, mm -hmm. that they're not, or they're going to heaven where God can hear and answer. There's so much more that could be said. Sermons, hundreds of sermons have been preached on the relationship of a husband and a wife. Mm -hmm. And again, as Dwayne brought out at the very beginning, Ephesians 5 speaks to this. What's the greatest example? Christ and his church. Church, mm -hmm. we need to be submissive to our husband. Period. End of discussion. We don't need to be sitting around trying to figure out ways to get around it. But we need to be submissive to our husband. Jesus Christ. We need to be listening to what he says and we need to be seeking his will above everything else in our lives. Mm -hmm. When we do that in our families, when we do that in the church, it's going to make a difference in the world. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. Wayne, you have any other further comments? Yeah, just wanted to throw one idea out there about prayers being hindered. I saw one commentary going back to my notes that one cannot be right with God when his relationship with another human being is wrong. Mm -hmm. That's right. So it's, it's, it goes beyond just your relationship with your wife. But if you have a relationship with another another human being that is wrong, then that could be a challenge with being right with God. And so we have to make sure that, that our, our lateral relationships, I've heard this before, you know, our side to side relationships are where they need to be so that our vertical relationship is where it can be. Right. And if, if we're not walking in, in unity and, and hand in hand, then we could not be in right relationship with God and therefore our prayers can't be hindered. That's exactly so right. So let me close that, let's just leave that thought as we close out, Tommy. I appreciate you, appreciate this study. There's so much we can draw from this, not only from, again, from our marriage relationship, but even with the state of our, our union, right? And our lateral relationship with man. You know, we, we need to make sure that lateral relationship is, is strong and we can all grow and pray upwards, right? And so that, that's where we always need to strive to be. That's right. Amen. Well, you want to lead us in a closing prayer, brother? I will. Let us pray. God of heaven and earth, we come before you so thankful for this day, and we thank you for your word. It has the power to save. It has instruction. It gives us a, a, the, your commands and the things that you would have us to do, Father, and we pray. Um, as men of God, as, as we strive to follow the words that you've given us and the commands you've given us, that we love our wives as Christ loved the church. We deal well with them, Father. We pray for all relationships as we study. There's a relationship between husbands and wives. There's a relationship between parents and children, um, those who have authority and, and those they rule over. Father, we pray that we can always walk in your example and we can show the world your example, how we walk. And Father, we pray that our inward man would always shine in our outward man. And we pray, Father, that we speak up when we need to speak up, Father. We remain silent when we need to remain silent. But more importantly, Father, we are so thankful for your son who gave us the example. He was humble. He was humble unto death, unto the cross. He was obedient to your word. And Father, he loved you. And what a great example we have to follow. And we thank you for that example. And we thank you that he was willing to endure the cross to give us the hope of eternity with you. And we pray, Father, that we never take that for granted. And we always understand and be willing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask, Father, that you forgive us of our sins. Bless our, bless our church, bless our leaders, bless this country. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.
Amen.